Well, brothers and sisters, as I mentioned, the theme for uh, Advent this year is what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? And and this morning, we're going to take some time to talk about um, not quite what are we waiting for, but to focus on how we wait. Because, of course, we know that uh, what we are waiting for, well, during this season of Advent is, is kind of a dual waiting for. We're, we're waiting for two things, really, which we will continue to talk about throughout our time. We are waiting, in a sense, for Christmas, for the coming of Jesus our Lord and Savior as a little baby so many years ago. That is partly what we are waiting for. But, of course, we're kind of not waiting for that because that's already happened. We are kind of reenacting, as it were, the waiting uh, that, w- that you know, the people of Israel had and the waiting that humanity had for so many years, waiting for the Messiah to come. And so it is partially a reenactment, but partially also Uh, readying our hearts to receive the infant King, God with us, Emmanuel. But we are also, during the season of Advent, we are waiting for Christ's second coming. For He has promised us that He will return. That He will come carrying victory with Him. That He will come to judge the living and the dead. And He will come to restore and recreate this world so that it is perfect. And He dwells with us in the new Jerusalem. And so that is what we are waiting for. But there's also the question of how it is that we are to wait. And so we are going to talk particularly from Matt, Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 40, and look at how Jesus Himself teaches us to wait. So if you want, you can turn with me to Luke chapter... Luke chapter... What did I say? 12. I lost it because, you know, that's the way it goes for me sometimes. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 verses 35 to 40. This is what Jesus says to His disciples and followers. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when He comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for Him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes? Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. The Word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we're going to talk some theater. As uh, many of you know, uh, I was a theater major in university. Um, I, I did a lot of acting. You did know that, right? Yeah, okay, good. Whew. All right, now, here's a play that's a classic that I never acted in, but, but I, I, I have a love-hate relationship with the play. A- and it is called Waiting for Godot. Anybody familiar? Yeah, yeah, you had to be. You were my, you're my wife. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, good, excellent. Wow, Tony, very nice. Good for you. Waiting for Godot is actually a classic play by, uh, well, a classic sort of postmodern play, uh, if you can say that. It's a classic play by Samuel Beckett, and it is so amazing and terrible. 
it is amazing and terrible because waiting for Godot is basically like an extended metaphor. It is, it is a couple of characters who are there on a stage that is very bare bones with a little pathetic kind of tree and just sort of wilderness all around. And, and the whole time, they basically articulate over and over again about how they are waiting for someone named Godot to arrive. And, and yet, Godot never comes. It's an extended metaphor for waiting for God. Sort of not very subtly hidden in the name Godot. <laughs> It is a metaphor for waiting for God. And in the play, Samuel Beckett, as the playwright, kind of articulates the hopelessness of waiting for a God that he believes will never come. How pathetic it is to sit there waiting and waiting and waiting for God who will never arrive. And of course, that is not something that we believe to be true. We believe very much that our God has already come, and we believe very much that His promise that He will return is true and good. He will come. But there's a second problem with that play. The second problem with that play is that while the characters are waiting for Godot, they do essentially nothing. They are constantly waiting around, talking more or less nonsense, and doing pretty much nothing. Now, of course, this can be a temptation for the Christ follower, for the person who does believe that God is going to return. The temptation to just sit around and wait staring out the window, waiting for God to come. But that is not the kind of waiting that Jesus is talking about in Luke chapter 12. That's not the kind of waiting that Jesus is talking about. Now, seeing as we're on a theatrical sort of vein already, uh, I can ask you this. How many of you have seen Downton Abbey? <laughs> a lot more than are familiar with waiting for Godot. <laughs> right? Okay, you've seen Downton Abbey. What happens when the Lord and the Lady go away for any extended period? Do all the servants just sit down and take a break and don't do anything? No. They have a huge list of things that they are going to do. For those of you who aren't familiar, Downton Abbey is, is, a, is a, a, a series, a TV series that is set in the 1920s-ish sort of era. And, and uh, you know, there are this huge mansion um, and the Lord and Lady of the House in England um, they, they take care of the, the servants and they take care of the people in the village, but it's during a time of great transition and, and things are uh, kind of going off the rails uh, as far as the class structure of England is concerned. But anyways, this huge household, they have many, many servants, and when the Lord and the Lady are gone, it is not that the servants just sit back and relax and do nothing or stare out of the window looking for the Master to come home. They are actively pursuing all kinds of tasks that they wouldn't get to do or have the time or luxury to do when the Lord and the Lady are home. And this is the kind of waiting that Jesus is speaking about here in Luke chapter 12. And so we need to, during this time, think about whether we are waiting, waiting as if, as if God is never going to come, or waiting as if we have nothing to do, or if we are pretending that God doesn't even exist, 
and we are running around like chickens with our heads cut off doing whatever we want to without paying any attention to God at all. How many of you have all your Christmas presents bought already? Good for you. Yeah, way to go. Did you get one for me? <laughs> Joking. <laughs> Not many of us have our, all our Christmas presents bought. This time can be really hectic, right? We can start to get more and more stressed out about what is coming in the Christmas season, right? Are you having company this year? I know that it's been tough sometimes over the past couple years to have company. Some of us are having company. Some of us are maybe not having company. We're having a bit of company, I think. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> Gwen's like, how could you not know this? I know we're having company. Just don't ask me when or who or how many or what I'm supposed to do. Anyways, we're... Right? We can get hectic this time of year. We can get running around trying to control what feasts and celebrations look like. We can figure out how we're going to make sure that people come and go safely. We're going to have figure out how we're going to make sure that all the presents are balanced properly between our various children. Or, or maybe we don't care about that. We're going we're to work hard to make this Christmas season special. But in doing so, are we forgetting about the God whom we are watching and waiting for? Are we forgetting about His call to be ready to serve? Are we forgetting about what kind of service He calls us to? Or are we just sort of morosely looking out the window, not doing anything. This is one of the things that is so beautiful about the community Christmas dinner. Not that this message is all about that or anything. But one of the things that is so beautiful about that little Christmas dinner is that you know, Cliff and the others who volunteer to do that, they take you know, four hours or more of their Christmas day to do the very thing that Jesus calls us to do. And that is to serve. Right? That's, that's part of the origin of this whole idea of Christmas presents and stuff anyways. Is to self-sacrificingly, out of love, give to those around us. It's rooted in very Christian ideas. That's partly why we say things like it's better to give than to receive. Right? This is the kind of service that Jesus calls us to. Not running around frenetically doing whatever we can to control the season that seems to run out of control. And not waiting around morosely for something to happen. But rather to serve. Notice what Jesus says. Right? It will be good for those servants, verse 37, whose master finds them waiting, watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. He will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. And isn't that so exemplified in how Jesus treated his disciples at the Last Supper. Right? He waited on them. He, he stripped Himself of, of His outer garments and He washed their feet. And He showed them in a real way, as weird as this might sound, what Christmas 
is all about. So, how can you and I be actively waiting like the servants at Downton Abbey? Well, we can help out with things like the, the Christmas dinner. We can help out with things like contributing to the Mission to Seafarers gift basket. We can help out by perhaps serving our families and our loved ones and our neighbors this year. We can contribute everywhere we go in everything we do. We can remember that truth that it is better to give than to receive. Brothers and sisters, it can be hard. Because there are so... There's so much separation between us as people today. I'm going to go off book, off script for a minute. (laughs) Um, So, a hundred years ago, in the 1920s, Right? Uh, the people of Downton Abbey, right? They all lived in their, I mean, it's fictional, but you get the idea. They all lived in their household, you know, like 20, 30, 40 people living in this household. And they had tight community. They worked together, they lived together. I mean, they weren't perfect or anything like that by any stretch of the imagination. That's one of the beauties of the show is that they show the character and the difficulties of these people. But then in their their village around there, the lord of the community was also the, the landowner of the community. And so he was responsible for all the people in the area. And they knew one another and they did stuff together. But But today, but today, right, how many of you actually live in Athens? We, we live in Athens, right? Um, not very many of us. A few of us live in Athens. H- how many of us work in Athens? I work in Athens, <laughs> right? A few of us work in Athens, right? But you live you know, up on Jellybee Road, or you live in Brockville, or you live in Prescott, or you live... Um, wherever and we drive to go here we don't go to school together a lot of us we don't work together a lot of us we only see each other on sunday our our community is separated far more than it would have been in 1920 right And, and then not only that but we have separated ourselves based on uh, on our upbringing we have separated ourselves based on our politics we have separated ourselves based on our ideologies we have separated ourselves ourselves sometimes based on gender or social class or or whatever right we're, we're not like downton abbey we're not like jesus and his disciples Right? Jesus went everywhere with his disciples for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for like three years or something like that. We're so separated. And, and yet, God calls us to be in that kind of close knit community of servants working in the kingdom of God. So how can we serve? The ways I mentioned before, but we can also serve by reaching out to each other. By saying, hey, how's it going? Really? How are you? Let's have a coffee. Let's go for tea. Let's go bowling together. Right? Brothers and sisters, our work 
being dressed ready to serve. That is active waiting. And it's not always about doing busy work. Often it is about caring for each other. For the people around us. Our neighbors. Having a good, kind word for the people we don't know. Let us be active waiters. Let us keep our lamps burning this season. And let us serve each other and our neighbors in Christ's name. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we wait for something glorious to happen, as we wait for Jesus to come as a little child at Christmas, and as we wait for Jesus to come as the King triumphant returning to earth, as we wait, O God, let us not be passive in our waking. But instead, let us wait actively, serving those around us. Let us not despair that God will never return like the characters in Waiting for Godot. But also, let us not just passively stare into the distance but instead, O oh God, let us wait. Let us wait doing good and building Your kingdom like the servants of Downton Abbey. Like the earliest disciples. Let us wait. Let us wait with our deeds building Your kingdom, so that when You return, O oh God, You will see that we have faithfully served You. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We do this, we do this active waiting because Jesus is our living hope, a strong and sure promise for today and every day. Let us stand together and worship Him with living hope.